O Lord, our rock and redeemer, what sweet resources we have in you, living in a troubled world, living in a mixed condition, living in a living as targets for an enemy with fiery darts. How sweet it is to come to you, to rest in you, to find your purposes for us unflagging, to find your love for us unfailing, and endless, unstoppable resources of strength to endure, to cling to you in faith. We know that if you are for us, none can be against us. You did not spare your own son. You delivered him over for us all. How will you not freely give us all things? No one could bring a charge against your elect. You are the one who justifies. Who could condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at your right hand, who intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. It is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long, considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through you who loved us. We are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We praise you for being so near to the weary, to the brokenhearted, <clears throat> to those who cling to you in meager faith. We pray now as we come before your word that you would work, that you would work in us to think about the world and ourselves and your church the way that you do. And we pray that we might recalibrate our thoughts, that we might align our lives to your purposes for us. We pray that you would do all these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> what comes to your mind when you think about missions? Super spiritual people? Far off places? Strange food? Strange dress? Strange customs? Abject poverty? an AIDS epidemic, human trafficking, modern slavery, war-ravaged nations, and an orphan crisis. Maybe you think closer to home. Maybe you think about income inequality or social justice or the homeless crisis here. Maybe you've had the experience of looking up the word missions in your Bible and not finding it. Looking for, for the word missionary Mission trip, mission agency, missiologists, missions conference, mission sermon, <laughs> and not finding any of those words there. We may assume if the word missions is not to be found in our Bibles that the concept of missions is extra biblical. Maybe it's optional for followers of Jesus. We then relegate missions to the specialists the super spiritual people who get on a plane to some far off place we've never heard of. And then we become content with a definition and an application of missions that really has very little to do with us. Missions just isn't for me, you might say. The fact that the word missions is not in your Bible does not make it unbiblical nor extra biblical. Rather, the concept of missions ties together some of the grandest and most important themes in the Bible. When we think about missions, we want these grand themes to echo in our hearts. And if I can do anything for us this morning, I want to tie our thoughts about missions to the Word of God. And in so doing, I hope to convince every individual at Grace Bible Church that missions is indeed for you. It is what you are here for. Far from being some mysterious enterprise carried on by the select few, missions is to be your enterprise our enterprise. It was in 2009 that the Elders of Grace Bible Church laid out our missions philosophy, 12 years ago. 
Uh, since then, we've been in three locations, have acquired a building, have become a training center for pastors, and have sent missionaries. That missions philosophy is really a foundation for our missions agenda, for the things that we've gone after as a church related to missions. And what we want to do over the next five weeks is revisit this missions grid or this foundational philosophy of thinking through missions. We want to do this for a number of reasons, and for the next five weeks, you'll hear from me, from John, from Omri, and from Josh. We want, first of all, to highlight the current efforts of missions that Grace Bible Church is partaking in. You heard from Wayman Lee this morning, who serves TLI, Training Leaders International, and Wayman goes to numerous continents training pastors who don't have access to rigorous biblical and theological training to understand the Bible, to understand doctrine, to understand how to study the Bible for themselves and to teach it to their people. A very strategic enterprise. You know that Massimo and Susanna Mollica are in, in Italy, and they've teamed up with Matt and Johanna Johnson. They're friends of the Andersons. They come from Grace Emanuel Bible Church in Jupiter. They are teamed together in Italy in a very dark place in the shadow of the Vatican, taking the gospel and plowing very hard ground there. You know about Team Doe in Papua New Guinea, Zach and Cassidy Can and Jude and Oliver, and Ryan and Elna Mitchell and their kids, Callista and Sebastian. You know of Amelia Brink serving in that team, having brought the gospel in an initial proclamation to the Doe people, uh, going through two languages to get there and learning linguistics and then learning a tribal language that no one outside the tribe knows and then beginning to teach that people to read and write their own language and beginning Bible translation and chronological Bible teaching to get the gospel, the Bible, and the church to people who don't have access. There are those training for further work in Papua New Guinea. Daniel and Sarah Bruce are here. Daniel is starting the Expositor Seminary in the fall to continue his training towards moving to Papua New Guinea to take the gospel to another tribe. Scott Maxwell is leading Finisteer Vision as executive director. Jeremy Lehman is serving Finisteer Vision as the ICBM. That stands for Intercontinental Business Manager, in case you were wondering. And of course, the efforts of Grace Bible Church itself, planted right here in Tempe, Arizona. All of these current missions endeavors, we want to bring to our attention again. And really, these are four different kinds of works. You think about training pastors on six continents is different than plowing really tough ground in Italy, evangelism and church planting in a very dark place, difficult place, where evangelicals are seen as a sect or a cult and, and are really stayed away from. We know that pioneer church planting amongst people who have never yet had access to the gospel has its challenges. Papua New Guinea is really far away. Language barriers are difficult. Cultural barriers are difficult. And the trials our team have faced have been immense. And a local church here striving towards New Testament local church ministry is a challenge. And all of you are involved in these various aspects of missions in our world today. We want to put this series in front of you to bring to your attention some other missionary endeavors that we are aiming at. The elders have been for some time, really for a decade, praying and planning towards church planting, uh, church planting closer than Papua New Guinea or Italy. You know that Omri Miles is planning to take a team to New Orleans to see a church birthed and grow and mature and multiply in his hometown. And we also have a desire to plant a church in the East Valley. And we are planning for Josh Kelso to lead a team of people to that end in the near future. And for the next five weeks, we are looking at missions, specifically tying missions to ecclesiology, really thinking about what is the church's role in missions, what is the idea of missions, and how does it relate to local church ministry. We want to put these things in front of you so that each one of you sitting here can think very carefully and very critically and can think biblically about how each of you are to be involved in these various tasks of missions. Before you decide that you should be training pastors with TLI, or before you decide that you should move your family to Papua New Guinea, 
or before you decide you should join the team in Italy or help Omri plant a church in New Orleans or be a part of Josh's strategic plan to plant a church in the East Valley, we want to think together biblically about missions. We want to think carefully about the church. What is God's mission? And what is our role in that mission? And so we'll be laying out some key principles that all of us need to be thinking about as a church together as we plan and strategize to see the gospel go out from us. I want to put in front of you some resources that you can be thinking about as we look together at missions over the next month. At the book table, uh, Omri has copies of David Doran's book, For the Sake of His Name. That is going to be, that's our July recommended reading. Is that right, Omri? So that's going to be available to you. Uh, you can talk to Omri at the book table about that. If you'd like to ask Omri about how you can get P.T. O'Brien's Gospel and Missions in the Writings of Paul or Andy Johnson's Missions book or John Piper's Let the Nations Be Glad or Dr. Barrick's book on Bible translation, uh, you can talk to Omri about all of those things too. He can recommend those and help you find those resources to help think about missions. Omri Miles has also written an entire hip-hop album on missions, uh, if you want to listen to that and get caught up to speed. I would also recommend to you books like biographies of William Tyndale. If we are indebted to people throughout church history in, in relationship to missions, the English-speaking world is particularly indebted to men like John Wycliffe and John Tyndale, who uh, brought the English brought to the English language God's word when the English language didn't have it. And we're all very comfortable reading English Bibles today because these men brought the word of God to us. I would invite you as well to come to equipping hour next Sunday. John's going to be teaching on Geneva as a model for mature New Testament congregations, equipping men and sending them out as missionaries many of whom, by the way, were sent to France under persecution and did not survive the sending. But you'll want to be here for equipping hour next week to hear that. I think that is a tremendous motivation for us to think about missions in terms of how does a healthy church, a biblical New Testament model church, fuel missions? And this is really critical for us to tie missions and the church together. For far too long, those have been divorced. Those two ideas have been separate from one another. And biblically, we want to see them as God designed them. So to that end, we want to give you a definition of missions. Glory, gospel, church, world. It's the title of the message this morning. It's the title of the series. Four words that describe the way we think about missions at Grace Bible Church. And we would define missions this way, the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ manifested in the church around the world. That's the way we see missions. The glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ manifested in the church around the world. Glory, gospel, church, world. So what I want to do this morning is give a little personal history of, of myself related to missions and then dive into those four words. I was a missions major and I graduated with a five-year degree from the institute that sent more missionaries than any other and I left that program wondering what in the world is a missionary? What is missions? Well, what is a missionary supposed to do? What is a missionary supposed to be? What is the underlying philosophical principles that guide and direct what missions must be? <clears throat> I had learned all the missiological vocabulary. I was aware of all of the current trends. I had read the classic texts on missions, and yet I was left derelict of a biblical tie to missions. I was left with a crisis of looking for the word missions in my Bible and not finding it, and then thinking, oh, the experts know what it is. That must not be for the common people. And since then, I have had a bit of a paradigm shift in thinking about missions. I have fallen in love with the local church. I have fallen in love with the New Testament model of what the church is and must be and have seen in the scriptures the church everywhere in the New Testament since Acts 2. 
And it is the vehicle by which God is taking the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And the Bible's very clear about what the church should look like, how the church should be populated, how the church should be regulated and governed, what the church must be and what the church must do. And if you think about it, the reason that we have church in Tempe, Arizona, is not because we're anchored to some archaic, boring thing that missions is the exciting stuff you do over there, church is the really boring stuff we do over here. No, the reason the church exists here about as far from Jerusalem as you can get is because Jesus said, I will build my church, and he has. And people have faithfully passed the gospel on like a baton in a, in a relay race from generation to generation. And Jesus himself has been faithful to establish, to equip, to lead, to head, to govern, to regulate his body, the church. So let's think about these four words that govern missiology for us. Glory, gospel, church, world. And we're going to tie these to four texts this morning. So this is going to be rapid survey of four anchors for missions for us. First of all, we believe missions must be doxological. Doxological. That's a nice big word. It comes from the Greek word doxa, which means light. It's the New Testament word for glory. We just mean that the missions, the way we think about missions, has to center on and revolve around and radiate from the glory of God. It must be doxological. It must be about God's glory. We sing the doxology. Uh, that is just an outburst of praise to God. And we say missions must be doxological because everything is doxological. Everything is working out in time, space, and history by God's design and by God's sovereign purposes to bring about his glory. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 11. At the end of Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, we see in print form a doxology, an outburst of praise from the pen of the Apostle Paul, where he is responding to the great things God has done, and he responds in praise, worship. He just interrupts this letter with a song. Look what Paul says. Oh, this captures the emotional outburst in verse 33. The depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. If fundamentally, if, fundamentally if, we are be, if we are going to be involved in something that we call missions, and it is not about the glory of God, we have failed. If our endeavors, if our enterprise is not about the glory of God, it isn't missions by any biblical description of what that word should mean. The point of this passage is that everything is doxological. We look first at what it is that Paul sings, glory be to God. And the glory of God is seen in who he is and what he does. Verse 33, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God unsearchable are his judgments, unfathomable his ways. And the Apostle Paul is just in awe of the very character of God and the deeds of God in this text. God's glory is seen in who he is and in what he does. The depth of his riches, his wisdom and knowledge, they're unsearchable, they're unfathomable. Paul goes on in the next few verses to describe uh, what is known and who gives counsel to God or who gives to God. God is the first. God is the source. He concludes with everything is from him, through him, and to him. The glory of God is seen, first of all, fundamentally in who God is and what he does. The glory of God is seen in his total independence from his creation. Look at verse 34. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Who first gave to God that it might be paid back? The answer to these rhetorical questions is no one. 
No one could give God information he didn't have. No one could counsel God about what he should do. No one has ever given to God that it should be repaid to him. God is debtor to no one. God is absolutely and totally independent of his creation. And then the glory of God is seen in the utter dependence of everything else. Verse 36, from him and through him and to him are all things. From him and through him and to him are all things. That means every creature, every inanimate object, every sentient being is utterly and totally dependent on God. And because of God's absolute independence from his creation and because of his creation's absolute dependence on God, to him be the glory. To him be the glory. No one could ever boast of having something apart from God that would be pleasing to God. From him are all things. No one could ever accomplish something that God would have to be indebted to him for. Through him are all things. And the end result of all time, space, and history is that God would be glorified. To him are all things. Now, why does, God, why does Paul have this outburst here in Romans chapter 11? Why is it that Paul sings? First of all, because God's glory is on display in the gospel. This is a pinnacle in the letter to the Romans. It is an outburst of praise for God's redemptive purposes seen in Romans 1 to 8. Now, we found out in Romans 1 to 8 that everybody's a sinner. Gentiles are sinners in chapter 1. Jews are sinners in chapter 2. The religious and the irreligious. Chapter 3, in case we missed the point, declares very clearly, no one is righteous, not even one. Everybody's a sinner. And from 321 and following, Paul unfolds the solution to sin. That apart from law, God put forth his son as a propitiation. That is a satisfaction of his own wrath against sin. So that whoever believes would have eternal life. In chapter 4, you have the example of Abraham who believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. In chapter 5, you have the truth of justification and all of its fruits. Those who believe in Jesus are declared righteous. They therefore have peace with God, a new relationship to trials, the love of God poured out in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 6, believers are given a new relationship to sin. No longer slaves of sin, but slaves of Christ. In chapter 7, believers in Jesus Christ have a new relationship to law. In Romans chapter 8, we're given a new relationship to God by his love through adoption. We are uncondemnable in verse 1 of chapter 8, and at the end of chapter 8, we are unseparatable from God's love. And so Paul sings... Glory be to God, from him and through him and to him are all things, is a reflection in song and an outburst of praise of God's immense glory, his wrath, his infinite goodness, and all that God is, and his redemptive purposes for sinners who will believe the gospel. Paul praises God for all of it. But Paul also sings because God's glory is on display, not just in the gospel available to sinners, but in God's plan to save people from all nations. And so this doxology comes in Romans 11 at the end of chapters 9 to 11, which is the unfolding of God's plan to save people beyond Israel. And you remember the illustration of the olive tree. Israel is that natural olive tree cultivated in the garden, and the Gentiles are the wild, uncultivated olives, olive tree. And God breaks off branches for unbelief, and there are those unbelieving branches on the ground, and God takes Gentile, wild, uncultivated olive branches and graciously grafts them into the rich root of the olive tree, which is the promises given to Israel. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And God is so kind to bring people like you and me into his family and into his redemptive purposes. What a gracious God, so that every Jew who believes, every Jew who is in heaven will say, I don't belong here. I don't deserve God's favor and his kindness. And every Gentile who believes that I was an outsider, uncultivated, I do not deserve God's mercy. 
And we would all say together with the Apostle Paul, from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. It is a doxological outburst in response to God's gracious plan to save sinners from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. What does this mean for missions? Fundamentally, missions belongs to God. When we think about missions, we're thinking about God's mission. And if we're involved in something we call missions and it is not fueled by the glory of God and all things redounding to his glory and praise for who he is and his redemptive purposes, then we've missed the point of missions. God has created and sustained the universe to make himself known, to put his own glory on display, and he has redeemed sinners to put things on display like his grace and his undeserved mercy. This is what missions is about. And it means that missions envelops every single one of us. It means that God's plan to put his own glory on display and to save sinners involves every saved sinner. Missions must be doxological. And this defines the kinds of things we must do in missions. It defines the kinds of people we must be. Missions must be doxological. Secondly, missions must be Christological. Christological. And by this, simply we mean it must be about Christ, Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. It must be about the saving message of Jesus Christ in the gospel. If I could have said missions must be gospelological, I would have said that, but that, I don't think that word exists. Turn to Matthew chapter 28, and just think with me for a moment about the Great Commission. This is the missions text. Go therefore and make disciples, Jesus said, of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There is that great commission. And this is the commission Jesus left for his disciples and the disciples of the disciples and the disciples of the disciples of the disciples to the end of the age. And when we fast forward this to Revelation chapter 5, we find this remarkable scene. Concentric circles of worship in heaven. And in Revelation 5, 9, this amassing of saints sings a song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. What do we find when we fast forward from the Great Commission to the throne room in heaven. We find people from every tongue and tribe and nation, people surrounding the throne of the Lamb, worshiping Him, forgiven, blood-bought. How do we get from Matthew 28 to Revelation chapter 5? That is the task of missions. We indiscriminately preach the gospel everywhere we go. God uses the indiscriminate proclamation of the love of God through Jesus Christ to bring people to himself, and it is successful. And it is successful right through Romans 10. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 10. This is our key text for missions being Christological. How do we get from Matthew 28 to Revelation 5? How do we get from the Great Commission to the great assembly through this text. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. This is the text that explains how people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people get to the throne room of the Lamb. They must come through Jesus Christ. They come through Jesus Christ. They come through the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a gospel that must be proclaimed, heard, and believed. And this message of Christ is powerful to save sinners. In verses 9 and 10, we see this. A faith that saves a person abandons self-righteousness to trust Jesus. Look what Paul says in verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This, we must understand from the context, go back to verse 5. Moses writes that the man who practices righteousness based on law will live by that righteousness. In other words, if you're trying to get to heaven by being good, by keeping the rules, by doing good works, or you think that law is your answer, whatever set of laws that you imagine, God says that is worthless. <laughs> if you think getting to heaven means keeping the rules and doing good, trying your best, you will fail. You already have tried, and you already have failed, and you've already missed the standard which is why any human religion that promises a pathway to heaven is a lie from the beginning. But faith righteousness does not say that, verse 6. Don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down? Or who will descend in the abyss to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith which we are preaching. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Do you understand the contrast? You couldn't bring about a Messiah. You couldn't go up to heaven and initiate the incarnation, come up with this great idea of a Messiah come to earth. You couldn't go down into the grave and pull Jesus up. In other words, the two things that are absolutely required for a sinner to go to heaven, that God himself would come in the flesh and die on the cross and rise from the dead, you could never accomplish and so faith righteousness, the only kind that gets you into heaven, doesn't say, how can I get to heaven and get things done? How can I bring Messiah up from the dead to get things done? You can't do it. Only God could do these things. And so faith in the proclaimed message of the finished work of Christ is powerful because the person who believes that Christ came and that Christ paid for sin and that Christ rose from the dead abandons all hope of self-righteousness pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps and trying to achieve what God demands. You could never do that. But God did. And a faith that saves a person abandons self-rule, surrenders to Jesus. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, that is, you abandon trying to be king of your own life and you say, Jesus, I want you to be king. I want to be a slave of Christ. Whatever you say, I'm yours. That is what saving faith does. The proclaiming of the gospel through Jesus Christ is the only hope for sinners. And this message is universal and exclusive. Look at verse 10. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. With a mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Whoever believes in him, the scripture says, will not be disappointed. This is the universal message. Christianity is not an American religion. Christianity is not a Western religion. Jesus is not a regional deity. He is Lord of all, and he is the only hope for every tribe and tongue and nation and people. This is the universal message, and it is exclusive. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there Paul quotes the Old Testament, whoever will call on the name of Yahweh will be saved, used freely to speak of Jesus. No doubt the New Testament writers affirmed Jesus as God in the flesh, evidenced by this text. But only those who call on Jesus 
will be saved. And then this message must be taken and proclaimed. And in verse 14 to 17, you have that litany of progression of argument. How will they believe unless they hear? How will they hear unless it's proclaimed? How will they proclaim unless they go? How will they go unless they're sent? Beautiful are the feet that go. How do people get from the great commission to the great assembly right through this text? The unvarnished proclamation of Jesus the Christ having paid for sin, surrendered to Christ and his lordship, that message proclaimed, that message believed. There is no other way. What does this mean for missions? Well, you don't have missions without the gospel. Any missions endeavor that doesn't proclaim this message can't properly be called missions. How will God get glory for himself in his person and in his redemptive purposes? Through the proclaimed message of his son whom he sent to redeem sinners. That is how God will get glory for himself through redemption. That is what missions must be about. It must be doxological and it must be Christological. Thirdly, missions must be ecclesiological. Another big word, you get lots of big words, but glory gospel church world. Ecclesiological just means missions must be about the church. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. For too long, missions and church have been divorced from one another. I really was taught by word and by example that the church is what you do here and missions is what you do over there. They're not really related to each other. In fact, the church is for stodgy, unspiritual people who don't get excited about Christ and just don't care about the lost. But missions is for those really super spiritual people who are going to do something about it. And if missions is divorced from church, then you can kind of do whatever you want. I mean, we're not the church, so we don't have to follow the New Testament pattern for what the church must be. Uh, what I was taught were uh, a number of very specific cultural appropriation uh, exercises. I, I knew I had to eat all the food in front of me and not be rude. I knew it was appropriate to learn the language and understand the culture, and we learned words like contextualization and things like that but I was not taught about the church. But I want you to see in Colossians 1 that the church is God's plan for manifesting his glory through his son to the world. Look at Colossians 1.18a. Jesus is head of the body, the church. Jesus is head of the body, the church. We see in this First half of a verse, five characteristics of the church as designed by God. First of all, the church is a called out people. This is embedded in the idea of the word church. The word ecclesia comes from two parts. Ek and kaleo means to call out. I know we have to be careful with parts of words and finding out what they mean based on their parts. You know, a pineapple doesn't come from a pine tree and it's not an apple. Uh, we have to be careful about butterflies. They're not made of butter etc. Um, but I believe this is a word that holds on to its etymological roots. Uh, the church is a called out assembly. Uh, the word was used often in uh, first century Greek for the calling out of people for a specific purpose, sometimes calling an army to assemble for battle. And the church, even if people had forgotten its etymological roots through common use, this is embedded in the very word. The church is a called out assembly of people. It's not enough to just gather people. These are defined as people called by God effectually through the gospel unto him and for his purposes by his grace. And it's not enough to just have Christians wandering about the earth in individual lone wolf fashion. They are assembled the church is to be an assembled people. That is, the, the church universal, or as some have referred to the church invisible, is to be gathered visibly, physically, in local assemblies. This is God's design. 
Jesus as head of the body, the church. We see also that the church is a regulated people. Uh, this is in the idea that Jesus is the head. Jesus is in charge. Jesus tells the church how to function. And the New Testament is a series of instructions about the church. I'll give you just a few commands from the pastoral epistles. The church is commanded to protect God's people from false teaching, pray for government leaders, instruct women, read the word publicly, exhort and teach, confront sin, care for widows, ordain some for service, instruct slaves, instruct the rich, cling to the truth and faith in love in Christ, disciple men, rehearse the gospel, teach holy living, refute and correct false teaching, sniff out wolves that are a danger to God's sheep, prepare God's people for persecution, teach, reprove, correct, and train with the God-breathed word, preach the word, do the work of evangelism, appoint qualified leadership, silence rebellious men and false teachers, speak sound doctrine, encourage godly living, avoid foolish controversies, reject factious people, encourage God's people to meet pressing needs. That's just a one section that gives the church very clear instructions on what it is to do and how it is to operate. And this is the instruction manual for missions. God's vehicle for missions is the church in expansion. And so instructions for the church become the operating manual for the missionary enterprise. We also see in this text that the church is a Christological people. Uh, we are under Christ. And then the church is an interdependent people. Paul here calls the church Christ's body. Uh, and a physical body is a great metaphor for an interdependent, organic organization of individual parts. We depend on one another. We are connected to one another. This is the way God has designed his church. So you get the one another commands in the New Testament to greet one another, speak truth to one another, confess your sins to one another. All of those one another commands imply a visible, physical, gathered people who are in each other's lives in interdependent life and fellowship. This is God's blueprint for the Christian life and God's blueprint for missions. How does the church fit in to the big picture of what God is doing? We see this in the context in Colossians 1. Look down at verse 13. For God rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through his blood, the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. What you have in this section of Colossians 1 is this cosmic plan, God's plan for the universe, God's plan for everything, and the church is right there in the middle of it. Grammatically, there are four parallel statements, and the church is parallel to these four statements. All things were created in heavens and in earth, rulers, dominions, authorities. All things have been created through him and before him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together and he is head of the body, the church. And really the first half of verse 18 goes with what happens in verse 17. There is a grammatical break in the middle of 18 and really he is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead starts a new section. What's interesting about all of that is the, the church... And God's plan through the church is right in the midst of everything he is doing on this grand cosmic scale to reconcile all things to himself. The church is not an afterthought. The church is not an option. The church is not accidental or incidental to God's cosmic plans. The church, in fact, is the vehicle by which he's bringing about this great plan of redemption and reconciliation. 
We can't do missions and take or leave the church. Missions is the church. Jesus said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The book of Acts is the unfolding story of the establishment and strengthening of local churches, expanding in concentric circles out from Jerusalem. The letters of the New Testament are mostly letters to local churches. The pastoral letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, are all given as an instruction manual for operation in the churches. The church is the organism by which Jesus promised to procure for himself a people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And so all of the instructions in all of the New Testament for how we do church are the instruction manual for how we do missions. We can't think about missions apart from the church. Missions that is not ecclesiological should not properly be called missions. We don't do church here and missions over there. We do missions over there because the church doesn't exist yet. Missions must be about God's vehicle for taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And what this does for us is it, it helps us who love the local church to love missions. Because missions is the bringing about of the things over there that we love here that they don't yet have. And this also ties our love and passion for missions to real, tangible, biblical instruction. We can do this. We can follow the script. Uh, we don't need the extra biblical expertise of an entire superstructure that's outside of Scripture to tell us how to do what's next. But we follow God's blueprint. And where the church is not in existence... What is the task of missions? To see the church birthed. And that comes through evangelism, discipleship, the training up of leaders. If we want to see God's plan go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth, then we will long to see God's church established and strengthened in those concentric circles outwards. We could define missions as ecclesiology and expansion, or as Joel James has coined the term, the church with a passport. That is a fantastic definition of missions. In fact, the little nine marks book by Andy Johnson called missions. Um, the local church goes somewhere. What is it? I can't remember. Local church, something about the church, is a fantastic resource that um, in a very small book where you can get behind God's plan for the church to the ends of the earth. What does this mean for missions? It means missions must be ecclesiological. It means the church must also be missiological. Right? The church can never be content with a cul-de-sac version of itself. You know, like the Dead Sea. This is where the Jordan River ends and nothing gets out. And it's really salty and you can float in it. Uh, it's comfortable. I like it here. I don't ever want it to change. Listen, a biblical church has in its DNA multiplication and expansion and training our favorite people and sending them to the other side of the world and crying. That's in the DNA of the church. That's what the church must be and do. It means not the us for and no more mentality of get the church to be my perfect little Christian community and keep it that way and don't let anybody new come and don't send any away any of our favorite people. The church is ever to be expanding its reach for the glory of God with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To understand what the church is, you, you're involved in a local church. You are immersed in missions. You are immersed in what missions is supposed to be. And you and I understand that involves people and relationships and sin and forgiveness, and it's hard. Growth is slow. When we think about missions, we have to get out of our mind the idea of movements, of rapid expansion, of some get-rich-quick scheme of God's purposes. It just happens slowly. And you know this with the Dodds and the Cans, with the Laymans, with the Mitchells, with Amelia. You know this with Massimo and Susanna in Italy, 
the, the work of seeing people come to Christ and seeing the church birthed and discipled and grown and nurtured to the point where it is established and multiplies, that is long, slow work, and yet it is God's work. That helps us think through how to pray for our missionaries. It also helps us think here missiologically. Think about this. Tempe is about as far from Jerusalem as you can get. And the reason the church exists here is because the church went global. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Glory, gospel, church, world. Fourthly, this morning, the church must be global. Global. Acts 1.8 is our anchor for this idea. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. What does that mean? Uh, that means the gospel would expand. It's in the DNA of the gospel to go out, to keep going to the ends of the earth. God's global mission was foreshadowed. Luke 24, Jesus said this would happen. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. A reference to Isaiah 43.10 where God said that Israel would be a witness to his glory and his redemptive work. Now the church, Jew and Gentile together in one body, expanding out from Jerusalem, get to be witnesses to God's redemptive work and to take it to the nations. And then God's global mission is fulfilled as the book of Acts unfolds. And you just trace the outline of the book of Acts from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and outward to the ends of the earth. The Finisterre Mountains in Portugal were the ends of the earth. Finisterra means ends, finish, of the terra, earth. And so the mountain range at the edge of Portugal was seen as the end of Europe. That's the ends of the earth, as far as we can see, as far as we know. Of course, we are now involved in the Finisterre Mountains of Papua New Guinea, appropriately named ends of the earth. It's really hard to get there. Jerusalem, by the way, to Tempe is 7,463 miles. Jerusalem to Papua New Guinea is 7,744 miles, about the same distance. Grace Bible Church to the Finisterre Mountains is 7,117 miles. We go the short way, not the long way. And Grace Bible Church to the Finisterre Apartment Homes is about 0 0.2 miles. I just think that's a great name for an apartment complex next door to us that needs the gospel. We need to go to the ends of the earth. Europe, Papua New Guinea, and across the street. When we think about missions as glory gospel church world, we're uniting those things that believers love, the glory of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the local church. And then we're just thinking carefully about this isn't home. This isn't the final product. But the church must expand, multiply, train, send, go. And all of this for God's glory. How would you rate your personal zeal for God's glory? Are you affected by the knowledge of people who do not yet prize God's glory? How would you rate your personal gratitude for the gospel? Are you affected by the knowledge that there are peoples on the earth that don't have access to the gospel? How would you rate your love for the local church, for Jesus' bride? In what ways can you love the church more? Are you affected by the knowledge that there are peoples who currently have no access to the church? How are you involved in seeing that the glory of God, the message of Jesus, and the church go beyond the walls of this church? Are you praying? Listen, just being a part of a mature, growing, faithful church where you're practicing the one another's is missiology. Do that well. You teach our missionaries that we're training what a New Testament local church is supposed to look like. 
so that they know what is to be reproduced. And of course, before a watching world around us here, the world sees otherworldly love and affection only produced by the Holy Spirit. What kinds of people ought we send to take the gospel to the ends of the earth? How should these people be equipped? How does God's mission to purchase people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people involve me? We'll be thinking about these things over the next several weeks. Let's pray together. God, thank you for bringing your glory in the gospel of your son manifested in the church to us. We will never get over the gratitude of what it means that you condescended to bring us love, light, truth, life. God, may we never get over these things. May we always be moved by them. I pray that we would be forever moved by the masses of humanity surrounding us, rushing headlong towards destruction. May we never be settled in our hearts over the plight of those who do not know you, both across the street and on the other side of the world. And I pray that you would use us, motivate us, move us by your glory and by the gospel and by love for your bride to take those things to people who have not yet heard, have not believed, don't even have access. We pray that you give us wisdom, endurance, strength, conviction for all these things, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.